Ahang Bante Ti Saranena Saha Pancha Silani Yachami Dutiampi Ahang Bante Ti Saranena Saha Pancha Silani Yachami Tatiampi Ahang Bante Ti Saranena Saha Pancha Silani Yachami Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samudhata 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 Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhutasa Buddhang Saranam Gachami Buddhang Saranam Gachami Dhammang Saranam Gachami Dhammang Saranam Gachami Sanghang Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami Tutiyampi Buddhang Saranam Gachami Tutiyampi Buddhang Saranam Gachami Tutiyampi Dhammang Saranam Gachami Tutiyampi Dhammang Saranam Gachami Tutiyampi Sangham Saranam Gachami Tutiyampi Sangham Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Buddhang Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Buddhang Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Dhammang Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Dhammang Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Sanghang Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Sanghang Saranam Gachami E sarana gamanam niti tam. Ama bante. Ana ti pata ve ramani si kata dan samadhiyami. Pana ti pata ve ramani si kapa dan samadhiyami. Dinna dana ve ramani si kapa dan samadhiyami. Ati na da na we ramani sika padang samadhi ami. Kami su mitha da na we ramani sika padang samadhi ami. Kami su mitha cha ra we ramani sika padang samadhi ami. Musawa da we ramani sika padang samadhi ami. Musa wada we ramani sika padang samadhi ami. Sura me raya manja pamada prana we ramani sika padang samadhi ami. Sura me raya maja pamada tana we ramani sika padang samadhi ami. Imani pancha sikha padani sile na sugati nyanti, sile na bhoga sampada, sile na nibuti nyanti, tasma silang wiso dha ili. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. 53b. Now, as regards the virtue of restraint of faculties shown next to that in the way beginning. Quote, on seeing a visible object with the eye, end quote, herein he is a bhikkhu established in the virtue of patimokkha restraint. On seeing a visible object with the eye, on seeing a visible object with the eye consciousness that is capable of seeing visible objects, and has borrowed the name I from its instrument. But the ancient Sporana said, quote, The I does not see a visible object because it has no mind. The mind does not see because it has no eyes. 
that when there is the impingement of door and object he sees by means of the consciousness that has eye sensitivity as its physical basis. Now, an idiom such as this is called an accessory locution, sasambarakata, like he shot him with his bow, and so on. So the meaning here is this, when seeing a visible object with eye consciousness, end quote. Apprehends neither the signs. He does not apprehend the sign of woman or man, or any sign that is a basis for defilement, such as the sign of beauty, etc. He stops at me- what is merely seen, nor the particulars. He does not apprehend any aspect classed as hand, foot, smile, laughter, talk, looking ahead, looking aside, etc., which has acquired the name particular, Anubianjana, because of its particularizing anu anu bianjanato defilements, because of its making them manifest themselves. He only apprehends what is really there, like the elder Mahatisa who dwelt at Chetia Pabata. It seems that as the elder was on his way from the city of Pata to Anuradha Para for arms, a certain daughter-in-law of a clan who had quarreled with her husband and had set out early from Anuradha all dressed up and tricked out like a Sarastra nymph to go to her relative's home, saw him on the road and being low-minded, he laughed a loud laugh, wondering, what is that? The elder looked it up and, find, and finding in the bones of her teeth the perception of bonus ugliness, he reached our handship. Here it was said, he saw the bones that were her teeth and kept his mind, his first perception, and standing on what very spot the elder because became an arahant. But her husband, who was going after her, saw the elder and asked, Venerable sir, did you by any chance see a woman? The elder told him, Whether it was a man or a woman that went by, I noticed not, but only that on this high road there goes a group of bones. I have a question about uh, the word foulness. The perception of foulness, ugliness, and he reached arahantship. Does he see it as foul, ugly, or it's more of like symbolic for like a, a matter of fact? Because when he see it neutrally to become an arahant, like he just sees it as it is, which I guess it is foul. I will get into these meditation subjects in the chapter on concentration. Uh, it's a little more complicated than just foulness leading to enlightenment. Foulness is a specific example of taking a single object as a object of concentration but why foulness or well not foulness but the parts of the body that we can consider foul why that's exemplified as a good object of meditation specifically for people who have lust passion the greedy temperament that, that helps to counteract lust in the beginning when one is trying to suppress the five hindrances that some people have Lust as a hindrance to a great degree. And so for those people, foulness allows them to more easily than another object enter into a sort of a trance state or a fixed state, then we call the samatha jhana. So he used that to enter into the jhanas. And because he had been practicing mindfulness, he was able to apply mindfulness to that experience. And practice vipassana based on his state of mind. Because those states of mind bring great uh, clarity and focus that you can then easily apply to see and then sugar out and let go. 56. As to the words through which, etc., 
the meaning is by reason of which, because of which, no restraint of the eye faculty. If he, if that person left the eye faculty unguarded, remained with the eye door unclosed by the door panel of mindfulness, this state of covetousness, etc., might invade, might pursue, might threaten him. He enters upon the way of its restraint. He enters the way of closing the eye faculty by the door panel of mindfulness. It is the same one of whom it is said he guards the eye faculty, undertakes the restraint of the eye faculty. Herein, there is neither restraint nor non-restraint in the actual eye fac faculty, since neither mindfulness nor for forgetfulness arises in dependence on eye sensitivity. On the contrary, when the visible datum as object comes into the eye's focus, then after the life continuum has arisen twice and, and ceased, the functional mind element accomplishing the function of adverting arises and ceases. After that, eye consciousness with the function of seeing, after that resultant mind element with the function of receiving, after that resultant root co causeless mind consciousness element with the function of investigating, after that functional root costless mind consciousness element accomplishing <clears throat> the function of determining arises and ceases. Next to that, impulsion impels. Herein, there is neither restraint nor non-restraint. <clears throat> on the occasion of the life continuum or, or on any of the occasions beginning with ad adverting. But there is no non-restraint if unvirtuousness or forgetfulness or unknowing or impatience or idle, idleness arises at the moment of impulsion. When this happens, it is called non-restraint in the eye of faculty. That, because when this happens, the door is not guarded. No other life continuum and the consciousness of the cognitive series. Like what? Just as when a city's four gates are not secured, although inside the city house doors, storehouses, rooms, etc., are secured, yet all properties, all, yet all property inside the city is unguarded and unprotected, since robbers coming in by the city gates can do as they please. So too, when unvirtuousness etc. arise in impartial in which there is no restraint, then the door to is unguarded. And so also are the life continuum and the consciousness of the cognitive series uh, beginning with adverting. But when virtue etc. has arisen in it, then the door to is guarded. And so also are the life continuum and the consciousness of the cognitive series beginning with adverting like what just as when the city gates are secured although inside the city the houses etc are not secured let all property inside the city is well guarded well protected since when the city gates are shut there there is no ingress for robbers so too, when virtue, etc., have arisen in impartial, the door too is guarded, and so also are the life continuum and the consciousness of the cognitive series beginning with adverting. Thus, although it actually arises at the moment of impartial, it is nevertheless called restraint in the eye faculty. An explanation of Abhidhamma. Basically, simply just trying to say that technically the seeing happens before the guarding, but it's still considered to be guarded because the mind, there's only one point in a, what we call the cognitive series where there can arise um, 
and things like judgment and reaction. And so it's at that moment that mindfulness replaces any kind of reaction that prevents the bias and judgment and bringing. But uh, in what sense is the life continuum guarded as well? Everything is guarded because there's only one entrance to the city. I thought it's like the life continuum, Chitta would just ar- arise and cease without. We without we being able to guard it or be mindful, but now that I'm saying it, I I know that, that yes, you can be mindful of that as well. No, that's not the point. The point is not that you're mindful of all these mind moments. The point is that there's only one mind moment in the series where uh, mindfulness occurs or doesn't occur. And once that is guarded, it's just like the door of the city. The whole city is guarded. You don't have to go around guarding every house because you've guarded the gate to the city. That's just a very elaborate way of explaining something very simple. Or it's a, a way of explaining that technically, technically you're not actually guarding the eye because the seeing occurs anyway. You can't stop that from happening. The guarding happens after the seeing. The guarding, you said that occurs at uh, one moment. Would that be the in the the series where it mentions the uh, the determining and then the um, the impulsion occurs and would would the determining be like the the judgment about it and then you know if it's like determined as good or bad that would uh, cause the impulsion to follow is that in the right direction I you know it's a yeah Dante is guarding the door the same as when we say um, remembering what is happening right now like using sati that this is this. Right, that's kind of a special determining where you determine that it is what it is. You don't, you don't determine anything about it. That's why remembering, right? The remembering means uh, reinforcing the uh, simple nature of the experience. Sanya. Sanya. Reinforce the Sanya, the recognition. So any, any technique that prevents one from Taking what is seen as beautiful, good, or something like that in a way that uh, arouses defilements is uh, guarding, guarding the cells. Oh, but yeah, potentially. I mean, uh, even some of the meditation requires mindfulness, right? Yeah. Yeah, but for me as a purely Vipassana practitioner, I can't imagine another way than just by being mindful of another way. So... Maybe that's why I think it's the only way. Well, the difference between Samatha and Vipassana is not going to be here, I don't think. But the point is that if you see an object as it is, that could be understood as mindfulness. Right? We remember this is this. But if that object is not impermanent, not, not unsatisfying, not uncontrollable, in other words, if it's conceptual, then you're not, it's not going to lead to wisdom. It's still considered guarding the senses because the object that you're aware this is a candle flame or this is uh, the earth element or this is teeth, for example, right? Bones or teeth. It's just a conceptual thing. Like teeth are just a concept. And if you keep saying teeth, 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 well, they're still teeth, right? They're not impermanent. But that's just because they're not real. So also as regards the phrases, on hearing a sound with the ear, and so on. So it is the, this virtue, which in brief has the characteristic of avoiding apprehension of signs, entailing defilement with respect to visible objects, etc., that should be understood as virtue of restraint of faculties. Remember that virtue here is sila. It's, again, it's going to trip me up because... That's not how we normally translate sila, but uh, whenever he says virtue here, he's talking about sila, morality, or ethics. Now, as regards the virtue of livelihood, purification mentioned above next to the virtue of restraint of the faculties. The words of the six precepts announced on account of livelihood, of the following six training precepts announced with livelihood as cause, with livelihood as a reason, one of evil wishes, a prey to wishes lays claim to a higher than he is not, not a fact. 
the contravention of which is defeat, expulsion from the order, with livelihood as cause, with livelihood as reason, he acts as a go-between, the contravention of which is an offense entailing a meeting of the order, with livelihood as cause, with livelihood as reason, he says, a bhikkhu who lives in your monastery is an arahant, the contravention of which is a serious offense in one who is aware of it. With livelihood as cause, with livelihood as reason, a bhikkhu who is not sick eats superior food that he has ordered for his own use, the contravention of which is an offense requiring expiation. With livelihood as cause, with livelihood as reason, a bhikkhuni who is not sick eats superior food that she has ordered for her own use, the contravention of which is an offense requiring confession. With livelihood as cause, with livelihood as reason, one who is not sick eats curry or boiled rice that he has ordered for his own use, the contravention of which is an offense of wrongdoing of these six precepts. I noticed uh, it says that avoiding, which in brief has the characteristic, basically, I guess, guarding is, has the characteristic of avoiding apprehension of signs. So you can, this happens if you're mindful throughout the day, right? It's not like you are actively avoiding to apprehend certain things or certain signs, right? In your experience. Well, yeah, does we mean avoiding in the sense that we use it like running away from or something? But it yeah. avoids in the sense of it. Avoid means it prevents basically. So basically what I'm saying, like if you saw it already and you just look away and try to avoid seeing the thing that you saw, let's say a beautiful woman, then um, that's not correct. Like the correct way would be just be mind mindful of the seeing, and that's how you avoid going into the signs and the particulars. No, but it's not exactly correct and incorrect. This is the way that it's done with mindfulness. It can also be done by closing your eyes or keeping your gaze lowered. This is something that monks are supposed to do when monks go into the village. They're supposed to look down at the ground. There are other ways of doing it. Sometimes you have to look, no? Or you have to talk. Well, Ananda asked the Buddha, what should we do regard what should we men do in regards to women? The Buddha said, don't see them. And Ananda said, what if we have to see them? And he said, well, then don't talk to them. And Ananda said, what if we have to talk to them? It should be like uh, the similar attitude if you want to cross a river, you find a place where the current is weak, not uh, violent and strong, but you still have to cross the river. So uh, avoiding uh, interactions that could potentially do a lot of defilements is a part of it. But once you are confronted with the situation, being mindful is the other part. I have a question, Pante. If a bhikkhu is sick, can they eat um, after the noon? No. There are five things that they can eat at any time and keep for seven days when they're, when they're sick. Now, those five things, some, well, yeah, technically only when they're sick. And those are things like honey and butter and oil. And the Buddha said, these things aren't quite food, so... We'll allow these when the monks are sick. Generally, when the monks are throwing up or when they can't keep food down, they aren't able to eat otherwise. Not just like uh, when they have a rash or something, they can eat it. You have to have a sickness that requires you to put something in your stomach. But yeah, regarding these rules, uh, there's a couple of things I was going to say. Third one, the one where it says a bhikkhu who lives in your monastery is an arahant. What that's referring to is um, if if a if a monk, I have to look exactly it up, but yeah, it must it must be if a monk says I am an arahant, with the intent that uh, people believe him, and that he's not actually an arahant, then that's I mean, and that person is no longer a monk. 
if people hear, if people actually hear him say it. Uh, but if he says instead, and that's what this is referring to, he's the only, suppose he's the only monk living in the monastery. I think, I'm actually not sure where it, where it doesn't cross the line, but it's like it almost crosses the line because he says, oh, in this monastery, there's an Arahan. But he doesn't actually say, I'm an Arahan. That's what this is referring to. Something like that. There's something where it's not quite a expulsion offense, but it's a serious uh, where it says ordered, it probably should better be uh, asks for vinyate yet. And you can't go up to someone and say, hey, could you give me some of this food or that food? Monks can't beg. Now you can, there's a rule that if someone invites you to ask, you can ask. This is misunderstood. There's not a lot of inviting, but we've talked about it. And like people invite you for the result. And it's useful if people understand because they, they feel like they just have to guess what the monk needs because the monk is never going to be able to tell them. But the, the, the deal is that if someone says, hey, is there anything you need? Or says, hey, if you need anything, if, you know, you feel free to let me know. That sort of thing. And there's no problem. But monks can also hint at something, right? Hint? No, hinting would be, I mean, hinting is, all, is, is no, is definitely just as bad but but like there's certain rules like money rules if you hint about money it's just as bad as if you took the money this is bad as if you said if you ordered people to do this with money or that money but you could say that this and this kind of food is not good for you without saying i don't want this food for example well that's if, in that case it could be because you have an illness and because you're sick you need a certain type of food and not for love but um, yeah, you can, I mean, the opposite is fine. You can say, I can't eat, like, I can't eat spicy food. You can say that. You can say what you can't eat. You can say, please don't give me this. Okay, then they won't give you it. It doesn't mean they have to give you something else. But if in your mind you're saying it, hinting at, hey, give me something else, then that's fine. 61. As regards scheming, etc., section 42, this is the text. Herein, what is scheming? It is the grimacing, grimacery, scheming, schemery, schemedness by what is called rejection of requisites or by indirect talk, or it is the disposing, posing, composing of the deportment on the part of one bent on gain, honor, and renown of one of, one of evil wishes, a prey to wishes. This is called scheming. I'm not sure if he is going to elaborate on this or where the elaborations are, but there's like things where, like when, when a monk receives food, uh, he might sort of grimace about it, I think is what this is talking about. And why you would grimace about it, you would say, oh, you would just be, you know, have a, have a sour look on your face or something, because it would, it would seem to people that this was a person who even with very fine food was not moved to greed or excitement about it. But the monk would do it in order to make people think that the monk was uh, some spiritual great, great person. I mean, it's really, these are just the same kind of scheming that you find among any part of the world. Monks uh, are sometimes guilty of engaging in this sort of thing as well. We're missing, it doesn't even have to be with food. You see monks who who have this very serious look on their face. And sometimes it's it's normal and natural, but sometimes it's also just putting on airs. And when they go into private, they're very different. But when they come into public, they look all enlightened and like a serious meditator. That's like the rejection of requisites. So they reject it, saying, uh, we, don't, we have no need for such luxuries or something like that. And then people are like, oh, this is a real monk. Let's give him even more of that sort of thing. And then he'll say, well, okay, since you keep pushing it, I guess I'll take it. But it's all an elaborate scheme to get people to, to uh, esteem the monk. 62. Herein, what is talking? Talking at others, talking, talking round, talking up, continual talking up, persuading, continual persuading, suggesting, continual suggesting ingratiating chatter, flattery, being supery, fondling, 
on the part of one bent on gain, honor, and renown, on one of evil wishes, a prey to wishes, this is called talking. Basically, any kind of usage of words to gain, make your livelihood meaning for the purpose of getting rather than just speaking in order that people can support you. Like you might praise people thinking, well, this will be, then they'll like me and they'll give me food. That sort of thing. There are going to be many kinds of activities that are okay and, and can be quite wholesome and beneficial if done for the right reason. And anytime you do it uh, disingenuously or insincerely in order to try and garner favor, that's been taken as long as I Of course, I mean, it's this kind of why are you why are you obsessed about these things? It's, people get obsessed. Monks even get obsessed with things that are of very little value in the long term. Is it is it wrong to wear, for example, white clothes for lay people or if they are not keeping the eight precepts, for, for example? I don't think it's entirely. I, I, I ask Sanka. I don't think so. I don't think they should. My my stance is they probably should be keeping the eight precepts. Right. So because it implies to me that they are keeping the eight precepts if they are wearing white all the time or something. You mean to the temple? No. No, I mean, in general. Yeah, general. People who wear white signifying as Buddhists, like when they become Buddhists, they wear white, even outside of the temple. Can we wear white clothes as well? The white uh, shirt for the students, uh, adult students, uh, pants are also white. So it's quite common that they are people wearing white clothes. Yeah, uh, people like, go all, all in white, even when they don't keep yeah. any precepts. Uh, yeah, when you are keeping precepts, uh, eight precepts, I think you have this thing around your shoulder, like a white towel to signify that you are keeping to the seal. That's uh, also true, of course, because even even non Buddhists don't wear even non Buddhists wear suits of white and all white clothes. But there are people who wear white all the time, like day in and day out. And yeah, I, my one of one of my teachers used to wear white all the time, but I don't think he ever kept more than the five precepts. So it, it was a little bit misleading. He was also he would do this around the monastery and in the meditation center. I think I, I feel now it was a bit misleading. And I know someone else who started wearing white and you know, running a meditation center and turned out wasn't even keeping the five precepts. Yeah, when 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 you when you go to a temple, you are expected to wear white, not very daring colors, or white or something close to white. Mm -hmm. But you'd even wear white even if you're only going to keep five precepts. Yeah, even if you go to offer flowers, you can still wear white. I mean, it doesn't matter. For lay people, there are no such uh, co conventions. They can wear whatever they like, but if you're going to a temple, you are supposed to wear white or something simple like that. It's just that it was so much associated with the opposite time and with the eight precepts. You actually read about people who would wear white and keep the eight precepts like it was the that man who had uh, 500 followers the lame there's uh, the description of Damika, i think where he's uh, a man who wore white clothes all in white keeping the eight precepts i thought that was this description um, the person who keeps the eight precepts is that they wear all white and so, of course, it's not that other people can't wear white or could never wear white, but it can be kind of deceptive, I think. Especially for retreats, I think it brings more value if you uh, go on a retreat and then you have to wear white, then it, uh, it's more special. I think that's where maybe getting at content, then you take it more seriously, almost like a uniform. Like, and if you all wear all the time white, it's yeah. like nothing special. I think it's it's the association I have with meditation centers. At our meditation centers, it's quite clearly delineated. People, when they take the eight precepts, they put on white. 
and there's people around the monastery who don't wear white, and that makes it clear that they are not the meditators, they're not keeping five precepts. But then you have people in the meditation center who wear white and just live there and keep only five precepts. And my sense is that they shouldn't be wearing white. And then I guess it's just in that context, in the context. But then I think of Dhammika, and it seems to be a pattern where this was a thing for Buddhists is that the white would signify. But I guess the point is that it's not that other people can't wear white, it's that those people who keep the eight precepts have to wear white. Or maybe the the question would be better if put if I if I ask like are you implying that you are keeping the precepts or you don't have this deception in mind or because if you don't have that deception in your mind then that's fine right the yeah. white sarong and shirt is uh, the national dress in sri lanka so you can see even the most of the politicians are wearing it in the parliament <laughs> <laughs> they don't imply that they are keeping to any precept. But I'm just thinking about the tradition, because if it is the case that that was a thing that that eight people keeping eight precepts would do, then in a Buddhist context, someone who wears that is potentially being a little bit deceptive because of the amount of support they might get or reverence they might get by people who say, well, this person who wears white every day, right? This person who's decided to always wear white lives in the meditation center. Maybe the person is a teacher. I don't really buy it. I think they shouldn't. They shouldn't have taken. I actually, when when I came back from Thailand, I wore white for like a, a year, something like a year. Just wore white every day because I kept the eight precepts. I was staying in a floor and on the floor in Stony Creek in the Cambodian monastery, just living on a rug. Going to university, but I kept eight precepts, and I would just went to the second-hand clothing store and bought all white clothes. I, I was like these people for a bit, and that's the sense I get that that, that it should be. If you're going to say I'm a Buddhist now and I'm going to wear all white, it should only really be because you're keeping eight precepts. I think the context is someone said uh, you don't have the intention to see or anything like that. It's obviously wearing white is not a bad thing. But if you wear white every day, you take it as a uniform. I think uh, you should be aware that that's the uniform for people who keep it in I think Anagarikas who um, are not quite the monk, but they're in between the lay life, lay life and the monk life and dedicate themselves. I think they keep 10 presets and also always wear white. I don't think they keep 10 presets. I mean, they might if they want to, but they think oh, okay. they can't technically keep the presets. Only a novice can technically keep them. Yeah, but even then they also wear white and it's not a great service to them if you also keep uh, not keep the 8 presets and wear all white. Yeah, I mean, out of reverence for that state, you know, I think it's valuable to respect it and say, if I'm not keeping the eight precepts, I'm not going to wear all white all the time. Paragraph 63. Herein, what is hinting? A sign to others, giving a sign, indication, giving indication, indirect talk, roundabout talk, on the part of one bend on gain, honor and renown, of one of evil wishes, a prey to wishes, this is called hinting. Herein, what is belittling? Abusing of others, disparaging, reproaching, snubbing, continual snubbing, ridicule, continual ridicule, denigration, continual denigration, tail bearing, backbiting, on the part of one bent on gain, honor, and renown of one of evil wishes, a prey to wishes. This is called belittling. Herein, what is pursuing gain with gain, seeking, seeking for seeking out, going in search of, searching for, searching out material goods by means of material goods, such as carrying their goods that have been got from here or carrying here goods that have been got from there, by one bent on gain, honor, and renown, by one of evil wishes, a prey to wishes, 
This is called Pursuing Gain with Gain. I wish you a good week, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Sad, oh, sad. Sad. Thank you, everyone. Sad. Sad. Thank you all. Sad. 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 Sad.